All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 21 of the Miami Tech Pod, our second in-person podcast. I'm Cesar Fernandez and joined by Brian Breslin, Maria Derchi, and we have a special guest with us this week, Jalak Jobanputra. Did I pronounce that right? That was perfect. Boom. Very cool. Uh, welcome to the Miami Tech Pod. Thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah. We, um, this, is, this is airing in the uh, what people are calling Miami Crypto Week. So this is really exciting. Um, but why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about your background, how you got into tech, investing, like where you're from, all of that good stuff. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, I'll start with the fact that I was born in Kenya. I won't walk you through every year of my life. No, but, that's... Uh, but that is one of the appeals uh, of, of being in Miami is, is, is that it is an immigrant uh, city. And that sure. was um, one of the things that drew me to moving here. Um, but I, uh, so I grew up um, uh, after moving to the U.S., going back to India and Africa, and, and was very interested in how, at the time, the commercial internet wasn't around. I'm aging myself. <laughs> but okay. but um, TV, radio, uh, uh, the printed word were around, and I thought I would become a journalist or uh, uh, do something in, in broadcast. Um, and, uh, and so when I went to college, I did communications. I, I picked up economics because I became, I took an econ class, loved it, became really fascinated by it, um, and went into uh, tech and uh, telecom investment banking. And then the Netscape IPO happened in 1995. Wow. And that was just a transformative day. I still remember it. And, and interestingly enough, when the Coinbase IPO happened uh, just recently, it reminded me, that day reminded me a, a lot of, of the Netscape IPO day in terms of like you could feel that you're on the cusp of something new um, and and so then I was sold on the internet and that kind of broader mission of how do we bring uh, more uh, access to information to people around the world who may not have had it and I thought the internet was was the way to do it and and then um, uh, started my venture career in 1999 out in Silicon Valley uh, worked for Intel Capital, so I was in the belly of the beast during the uh, internet boom and the bust, and I'm, I think it's very important to be through uh, cycles. Yeah. Um, and certainly in crypto, we've had many cycles uh, in the last eight years that I've been involved. Um, and, and then I moved back to the East Coast. I was at various funds, uh, including uh, running emerging market investing for mobile um, uh, it, at Omidyar Network. Cool. Um, and so I invested a lot in the Philippines, Mexico, Brazil, uh, Kenya, Ghana, India, um, and, and really started thinking about my own thesis uh, and, and a fund that I would put together that mm. combined the best practices I saw uh, around the world. I mean, there was certainly a massive lack of diversity in, in venture, which mm -hmm. is now obvious, but um, it was something that I lived and breathed every day, and I, I thought that VCs were leaving money on the mm -hmm. table um, by not looking globally, by just going to their own smaller networks, um, sure. being based in the mm -hmm. Valley. Right? I moved back to New York in 2004, and I remember uh, a lot of uh, folks from the Valley just thought it was like career suicide mm -hmm. yeah. to do that like because New York. New York was not a burgeoning tech ecosystem it's until like really the last tech. 10 to 12 <laughs> years. And, it, you know, it's we'll get to Miami, but mm -hmm. but it's interesting what people are saying about Miami it reminds me of what people said about New York not that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, and and so um, uh, eight years ago, I launched Future Perfect Ventures mm -hmm. um, about the same time I went to my first business. Bitcoin conference in 2013, and uh, was just sold on on crypto, blockchain tech. Um, again, going back to that, giving um, the underserved access. Mm -hmm. um, and with the internet, it was information. With sure. with crypto, it's it's about transactions, about assets, micro transactions. You know, I could to potentially tokenize this building we're in. And and uh, someone who lives down the street could buy a piece of it, mm -hmm. and 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 that 
to me is going to transform the mm -hmm. world. Uh, we were very early uh, in that thesis, but it's so exciting to see how the sectors developed and, and excited for uh, Miami Crypto Week next week. Cool. So tell us a little bit of how you ended up in Miami. So um, it's another COVID story, mm -hmm. uh, like, like many that have ended up here. So I've been coming to Miami um, uh, for many years. I'm a big art fan, so uh, at least like the last 15 years coming to Basel. I've mm -hmm. um, done a lot of speaking over the years. Uh, Miami's been a big crypto hub uh, mm -hmm. for, for many, many years. The North American Bitcoin mm -hmm. Conference was one of the first I went to in 2013. And uh, so... I, I've always liked Miami. I like the vibe here. I, I like it. Reminds me of places like New York and London, which have a diversity of um, of not only people but industry. Mm -hmm. And as you know, tech moves to the mainstream in any way. You know, we've seen it with the internet. We're going to see it with crypto, uh, where you start to have different use cases that the average person. Uh, can utilize a technology. I think being in a place like Miami is, is so important. And I mentioned it's an immigrant city. Mm -hmm. uh, I I love that. You know, I think there's a hustle that immigrants have <laughs> uh, that uh, is attractive. I mean, I have it. A lot of our entrepreneurs do, and it's been the gateway to Latin America. Um, and I'm passionate about emerging markets. And, and so what I hope it also becomes is the gateway to the world um, and, and these other regions that I've invested in mm -hmm. over the years um, and have portfolio companies. And a lot of those entrepreneurs are, are coming in next week to, to check it out mm -hmm. and potentially start offices here. Cool. And you're pretty, you bought a house, you're in, you, it predated the tweet. Yes, it did. It was last September. It so was you're almost September. a year in. Yes, yes. So she's an early adopter by yes. transplant. Uh, <laughs> have you been early on everything? <laughs> yes, it sounds like it. Crypto, I, moving, like it. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. Cool. And I say unfortunately because it's not always the easiest way to live because 99% yeah. mm -hmm. of the you know people out there think you're crazy. How do you that that's a really interesting point. Like how do you block out that noise when someone's like, why, why are you moving to Miami? Or like mm -hmm. when you're in the valley and you're like, you're moving to New York. Like are you, are you leaving tech? Are you okay? Like are you, like wh how how do you kind of um, like. Do you just move without any type of influence of other people's opinions on you, or like how, how does that talk talk to us about that? Yeah, that's pretty much the way I live my life. Yeah, um, it's great. and apparently, <laughs> if, you, if you talk to my parents, I've been like this from when I was a baby. <laughs> that yeah. I didn't really pay attention to what anyone else was yeah. was telling me. Um, even uh, so, I, I didn't get into this part of the story. But uh, I left investment banking to do an internet startup in 1997. Um, oh, and okay. I was an expat in London. Um, what's, I lived, what's the name of the company? Uh, it's called Horse's Mouth. Okay. Um, and I was a co-founder along with a number of other folks that I went to undergrad with. And um, we distributed financial research online. It's still around. Uh, never oh, cool. went for venture funding. Um, it was it was funded by one of the co-founders' uh, fathers, who uh, was a broker on Wall Street and wanted to figure out a way to use the internet um, uh, to empower brokers. So at the time. People were uh, very focused on companies like E-Trade and Ameritrade mm -hmm. that were completely disintermediating the right. broker. Mm -hmm. But he thought, and we all agreed, that the internet could be used as, as a tool sure. for the brokers to build better client relationships. And, and so, um, so when I left, I, I lived on, for those who know London, I lived right on Sloan Square. Had a, a, yeah, I used to throw parties at uh, uh, Simon Le Bon, if, you know, I'm sure a lot of younger people don't know who he is, but, <laughs> but Simon Le Bon from Duran Duran used to sure. come to my parties. Cool. <laughs> and I uh, ha had a pretty nice life in London, but I, I was just so compelled to uh, like experiment hands-on with this yeah. new, new medium called the internet. So that was, so I do things like that all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Future Perfect was, was a prime example of uh, not only were we focused on crypto and blockchain when um, you know, there are only three or, three or four other funds worldwide mm -hmm. that were uh, looking at the sector with a thesis in the sector. Uh, 
And I also thought early stage investing had to move more global, which mm -hmm. uh, most people did not agree with because um, it, it had been a very, you know, you had to be with the entrepreneur down the street. You know, you didn't mm -hmm. even get on a plane to see the entrepreneurs. Uh, and then the other is building um, a diverse fund from mm -hmm. the ground up. I mean, it's literally in my DNA. I don't have to go out there and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, talk about how we're great for you know diverse entrepreneurs. Sure. <laughs> we, yeah, we yeah. welcome everybody and yeah. always have. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, like I, I just and but if I'd listened to anybody when I started Future Perfect, um, my mentors, anyone would have said that's crazy. You're not going to succeed. Perfect. So um, I've learned to just kind of follow my gut. And you know, if I fail, I fail. I know the risks I take. So do you think you have a lot more competition now for all these global deals? Like, because like a few years back, 500 startups was like famously yeah. sp spraying mm -hmm. and praying globally, right? At the yeah. seed stage. Uh, like, do you think you have more competition like for that deal flow or is it still like blue ocean for you? Yeah, yeah I, I view the next five to 10 years yeah. to be our golden age. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be a golden age for crypto and I think yeah. it's going to be future perfect yeah. ventures golden, which is why when people in, you know, in September thought I was moving to Miami to retire, I was like, yeah, no, we're just getting started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. it's, it's uh, a, it was a repositioning trip. Basically. Right. I do think there's more competition, mm -hmm. but I also think they're great entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. just haven't had access to funding and mm -hmm. now they have options and yeah. and I think that's great I think entrepreneurs should partner with the investors that are uh, best suited mm -hmm. for their companies and what journey they want to have so for example not every entrepreneur should be raising you know hundreds of millions of dollars and we're seeing that in crypto yeah. where some of the rounds are you know two to three million dollars and and then they decentralize the platform and issue mm -hmm. the tokens to the community mm -hmm. and we want to be part of that first two to three million and we are sized as a fund to be able to do that mm -hmm. um, and and so that um, uh, so I think we're always going to serve entrepreneurs who are looking for an investor like us that's global, that has a lot of expertise and, mm -hmm. and network around crypto, and then has a broader network. You know, I've been around for a while. I was at Intel. I um, was at Lehman, which alums are all over the place, especially in crypto, mm -hmm, because sure. they get <laughs> they yeah. get why we need crypto. Yeah. Uh, and, and, Th that and one's <laughs> stung, <huh>? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So, so, so it's, it's all of that, that we, yeah. you know, and, and I certainly don't want to partner with an entrepreneur that doesn't uh, understand the value mm -hmm. we're yeah. bringing to yeah. the yeah. table either. So. Yeah. so my theory on this is like, I've been dabbling in crypto since like 14, 13. So around. you were early. Yeah. And then I sold early, which was whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not starting my own fund, uh, but um, I like, I think we're still like, it feels like it's still early stages on a global scale as far as like normal people adopting it right and yeah. i think i'm curious to think or to ask is where do you think we are sort of relative to like if you look at the trajectory of the internet mm -hmm. you know from the mid 90s to to now right we're 25 26 years in right um do you think we're like comparable in the crypto space to like 2004 you know internet like economy or is it further along because it accelerated faster like what's your sort of reference point yeah it's it's Brian, so brian's asking you to speculate hard right now. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. at least he didn't ask me what the price is going to be <laughs> no, no. I, I, I have my we'll number get, we'll get to that we'll get to that um no this is something i think about all the time because some days it feels like we're at 1995 yeah. because there's so much infrastructure yeah. build out that right. still needs to happen if you think about all the broadband and this is where my telecom and media um background comes in there was a lot of broadband mobile connectivity that was built out mm -hmm. um, if you look at all the different protocols out there i mean ethereum scaling they're moving to proof of stake um, uh, there's uh, solana there's algo mm -hmm. there uh, we were early investors mm -hmm. in, in polka dot in 2017 mm -hmm. and they've been um, uh, building very quickly mm -hmm. also so there's um, uh, there's a lot of building happening. Yeah. So I do believe it's it's all turbocharged, and the fact that it's open source is yeah. making it happen yeah. so much faster, sure. and and that's what's exciting. But there's still a lot to do. So mm -hmm. sometimes I think we're at 95, and then um, and 
And then other times when you look at some of the applications that are being built out, it does feel like much mm -hmm. later. But we're still going through speculative booms and busts. Yeah. Um, you know, very similar to what happened in the late 90s. Um, we just, we, we've seen it with the NFTs. Mm -hmm. um, now, that doesn't mean that companies aren't gonna be around. I mean, we've mm -hmm. invested in, in some great companies mm -hmm. in the space, um, but there's still, like 95% of what we're seeing out there is very speculative. Right, and right. and so it's really hard to gauge. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I used to say we are at 90, 1995 and, 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 you know, sometimes I still feel like we are because mm -hmm. I think about all the potential, what needs to happen. But, um, but I also feel like the applications are bu being built in real time along with the infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is something that didn't happen with the internet. That's interesting. Like to me, I think you could also make a analogous sort of comparison between like Coinbase and Netscape, right? Mm -hmm. So Coinbase gave a, at least in the US, it popularized sort of a, a GUI interface to the blockchain, right? It made it so, sort of simple. I know, I, know, I know there was plenty of wallets and other custodial services and exchanges and all that stuff before, but like Netscape was the first popular mm -hmm. GUI interface or GUI browser you know, to the World Wide Web, right? You had Mosaic and other things, but that was the same team, right? Yeah. Mosaic turned into Netscape. So I'm curious, like, what, like, what's the next, like, the next step, right? Is it, like, I've been sort of researching a little bit. Not, I'm not I, an expert on any of this, but, like, there's all this talk about Web3, you know, and all this decentralized dApps and, and mm -hmm. all that stuff. Like, what do you think is going to be the... Who's the winner in the next sort of phase of all this? Yeah, so we have this. And, and who should we invest in? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, why, that, <laughs> that's why people invest in my yeah. fund. <laughs> there you go. Boom. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> right, that, that's, that's the right answer, right? Yeah, if you yeah. want to be on the next wave, yeah. invest in me. Type of. Well, I also, and, and obviously I'm biased, but, mm -hmm. but I think things, and, and you know, I mean, things are moving so quickly in mm -hmm. the sector that, I mean, I work 20 hours a day out of, um, you know, the, the passion for what's happening mm -hmm. in the sector. So I, I don't, you, you can invest and get lucky or invest with one team that you know really well that you believe in, but there's so much happening across the spectrum mm -hmm. that um, unless you're focused on it 100%, uh, it's, it's really hard to, mm -hmm. to really gauge um, what the competitive landscape mm -hmm. looks like, et cetera. Um, but I, I have always believed that, we're, and, and this is from our thesis in 2014, that everybody should be a node on this decentralized web. Mm -hmm. And that node will contain each person's information. So mm -hmm. our education credentials, all the assets, so whether it's a non-fungible token or a piece of tokenized real estate, mm -hmm. um, our healthcare, everything will be encapsulated mm -hmm. in our own personal wallet. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can permission it out, different apps can access it. And, and, and so in a way that's a lot more transparent and mm -hmm. secure than what we've seen through, you know, web server infrastructure. But so. do you think for that to like take hold, we need to have also distributed computing for this, right? So that each person's home router is their computing hub or process, like uh, their miner, mm -hmm. so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. For lack yeah. of a better word, because right now for many of the big uh, cryptocurrencies, mining is very concentrated in a few geographic yeah. locations, right? And that mm -hmm. sort of goes in, it's an antithesis to the the theory that this is all truly decentralized, mm -hmm. right? What is it? China has like forty percent of although that's mining. come down a lot. Yeah, yeah. But, but like yeah. you know, sure. yeah. so I'm curious if you think like that's where we're gonna end up going. Where like Maria has a, a home server, you know, mm -hmm. to handle her and her husband and their dogs' crypto <laughs> interests, you know. Um, she's been secretly like mining her dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I know. They, they, all, they all have each of her dogs has a social security number, a bank account. It's wild. Yeah. Just kidding. Just kidding. Our, our, our listeners are well aware of, of Maria's dogs' clout. Yes, uh, they have bit clout accounts yeah, for sure. I, I yeah, that is yeah. something. Yeah. Um, you know, Maria's Maria's an early adopter, <laughs> but you know, I think we will. Uh, I I and and this goes back to um, having been at Intel and mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking at the semiconductor industry and and um, the. Uh, 
uh, kind of advancements we've had in processing power. I mean, there's a lot of um, a lot of talk about how much you know pa- electricity uh, that Bitcoin mining takes, mm-hmm. but if you really um, look at how much technology is moving along mm-hmm. in terms of batteries and semiconductors and, and GPUs. I, I think we are going to live in a world where, I mean, already our phones have more mm-hmm. processing power than NASA had mm-hmm. when they put somebody on the moon, right? So so it, it's inevitable wow. that that is going to continue so. to evolve. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the key and what we're most interested in investing in right now, other than you know continuing to invest in some of the infrastructure is, what, who are the teams building those mm-hmm. those user friendly interfaces? Mm-hmm. Because I mean, 1999 internet, nobody thought anybody was going to buy anything off of the web because and it Jeff, was such a clunky process. Jeff to, Bezos to do that. did. <laughs> well, yeah, but yeah, you know, I, I mean, kidding. he's I'm, also I'm the kidding. richest guy in the world now, right, so, right. <laughs> and we are not. Right, right. <laughs> um, but. Um, but you know, most people dismiss that. Most yeah. people dismiss that we were ever going to watch a movie. I mean, Blockbuster mm-hmm. um, certainly uh, dismissed it. R.I.P. Blockbuster. <laughs> so, so um, I, I think some of these ideas that we're talking yeah. about are not that yeah. far off. Where we'll all be mining uh, cryptos and 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 benefiting from that mm-hmm. and depositing those into our personal wallets mm-hmm. that we have, and then we'll be able to interchange uh, that crypto mm-hmm. with other things. We may have our own like you know uh, uh, social currency Mm -hmm. um, through good acts we may do or things with that we may so I think it I I think the future is just like we can't even begin to think about all all of these things but it's being built right now Mm -hmm. so um, you were an early investor in Uh, blockchain.com seed round and um, I I have a couple questions on this but number one uh, you know I'm not going to disclose how much, but Peter shared with me that he like back in the days gave a bunch of, you know, Bitcoin away to his friends because it was like, you know, funny and cheap and like, you know, transacted in it. Um, how many tens of thousands of Bitcoin did Peter give you? Like, oh, like was, it, was it like, um, you know, just ballpark it first. I love how you just slept that in. Yeah. <laughs> He allowed me to invest in the company in his first five hundred thousand dollars that he raised. So that wow, was uh, he only raised a small amount before the A, which Lightspeed and, and Google Ventures participated in. So that is my only answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but you know, it, we've seen like w- one of the things I, I think is is fascinating, right? Just like the sheer number of accounts that. Um, these companies have, right? Blockchain, Coinbase, I mean, we're in the tens of millions of accounts in, in their wallets and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And it's it's fascinating because, you know, I love your your take. If you, were, if you were to just like line these up and compare them to the size of accounts of banks, right? Like, you know, blockchain and, uh, and Coinbase would be top 10 banks in size, right? Mm-hmm. At least in the US. Um, how do you think the the traditional financial institutions are thinking about this, right? Like, is it, do they think, of, is it still like head in the sand mode or are we seeing like significant, you know, bet hedging here in, in on Wall Street? Oh, I think they're all concerned. Um, and, and this last year has been pivotal in that um, I have been going around uh, making the rounds on Wall Street for the last eight years um, uh, talking about Bitcoin Mm -hmm. and and crypto and blockchain tech. Um, And the amount, the the difference in their internal activity in in their reach outs, I mean, the tone has changed completely. Um, And and part of it was that during COVID, we, everybody started using, was forced to use digital banking, these branches, which are so antiquated. I mean, you go to Africa, you know, you go, you go to other places. I mean, they're not going to a bank branch and waiting in line to mm-hmm. see a teller, right. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so we're, ve- we've been very far behind in the U.S. Mm-hmm. In, in the way our banking system has worked uh, sure. because it's legacy. Yeah. And, and so I think they've real, and we've also had Neobank, we're an investor in Current, um, which is one of the largest Neobanks in, in the US. Um, they just raised at, um, I think, close to a $3 billion valuation. 
uh, we were first money into that company. Cool. And, um, and they, they, their business has been built on um, serving the underserved, the, the mm -hmm. underbanked in the United States. Um, and they, I mean, they've been growing phenomenally fast. And, and they were able to get stimulus checks to people well before anybody who had a traditional banking account um, because of their tech backend. So I, I believe that um, these banks are threatened. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're starting to see acquisitions in the space. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have a, a bunch of crypto native banks that are going to um, uh, be a force also yeah. and be real competition for the traditional banks. And, and they're much more nimble, they're much more global, um, uh, they're much more distributed, um, they have much better tech from the outset. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I finally think we're going to see a disruption. Um, but there's going to be consolidation too. There's an interesting point you made there. You were talking about how like a lot of places around the world sort of skip the retail banking sort of uh, phase of the industry, right? And there's been, over the years, there's been a lot of talk about like, do, is sort of innovation a linear thing or does it skip generations of sort of infrastructure, right? You know, globally, the mobile phones and smartphones skip the landline infrastructure yeah. that necessitated. And so do you, th like, do you think blockchain and all that is gonna help not just banking, right? A yeah. lot of other things skip that generation, right? Because yeah there's so many areas that don't have access to, to broadband, right? And yeah. so Skylink could be one of the ways of skipping that, you know, yeah. like, so I'm really curious if, like, if that plays into your thesis yeah. so that I can go and tag along and invest in all these. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're follow we're on. So now yeah. I know yeah, yeah, why yeah. I'm here. <laughs> this isn't actually being recorded. <laughs> this is just... <laughs> Caesar's been taking notes I, and I executing trades. I am, yeah. so. That would be really, like, what, what a move if yeah. we just, like, didn't really record these. <laughs> <laughs> so that, again, was part of our, yeah. our early thesis mm -hmm. of that emerging market. I mean, we, we've seen them leapfrog yeah. um, from landline to mobile. Um, uh, and, and also, like, if you look at agricultural data, mm -hmm. like farmers in a lot of these emerging markets have been using their mobile phones yeah. um, to, to get weather data yeah. in a way that um, it hasn't, you know, reached mm -hmm. uh, the same uh, uh, volume of that in, in, in places in the U.S. that have other, other, other technologies and systems in place. So I, I, I do believe that blockchain tech, I mean, if you look at just insurance, mm -hmm. And, and, and it's a combination of smart contracts and IoT, and, and that was also part of it. It's, it's blockchain in conjunction with other technologies, so smart contracts plus uh, sensors mm -hmm. everywhere. Now, uh, you can have micro-insurance products for, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, most of the world doesn't have any insurance. Uh, car insurance or healthcare mm. insurance, and and so yes, I believe that there are going to be new business models enabled uh, by this infrastructure mm. in places that never had it, and and just like so, I've invested in telemedicine over the years too. Telemedicine just you know, hit some critical mass during COVID in the U.S. And the telemedicine's been around forever in mm -hmm. Africa, Latin America, India, because you didn't have as many doctors and you had more rural areas. Mm -hmm. And and so um, I believe a lot of these innovations, and I wrote a, 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 a post, I don't know, 10 years ago called One Third is First. Mm -hmm. it's a, it was about business models that were in emerging markets mm -hmm. that were actually going to be adopted by the West. Um, because they leapfrogged and mm -hmm. they were going to be able to show like what could be done in more efficient ways uh, and through tech new technologies. Mm -hmm. So yes, we are very much monitoring new business models in, in a lot of these places. That's very cool. I, I like sometimes it makes me wonder like are we at a disadvantage by being in this sort of linear or incremental in innovation sort of society because we you know we're not being forced to say, like, why do we need, you know, tractors, you know, for our agriculture? Why can't we jump to the next thing, you know, or whatever it is, right? Yep. Um, and whereas other people have the advantage, advantage, right, of that next, or that incremental step doesn't really make sense, right? Why, like, or we don't ask ourselves, why is this absolutely have to be the next step, right? Like, we just go with the flow. Well, like credit cards. Right. I mean, we have credit cards. Yeah. When I got into Bitcoin, yeah, I was out raising that first fund and mm -hmm. 
people in the U.S. were like, well, we don't need anything. We don't need, yeah. we have credit cards. Yeah. That's how we pay for things. Yeah. We, and why would we use Bitcoin? Uh, and, and people aren't aware of the fees associated with credit cards and sure. because it gets passed to the merchant. And But, it, you know, it's, it's about... It's just about the fact that we have these things. We use them. Uh, people don't like to change behavior. Mm -hmm. But if there's pent up demand and people haven't had the opportunity to transfer money and mm -hmm. there's a new technology, they'll learn that really quick. There are grandmothers in, in Kenya that were showing me how to use M-Pesa, you know, back mm -hmm. <laughs> in the day. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's also the fact that, you know, I also believe that tech isn't just for young people. I mean, I do think there, I, I think. Um, Gen Z gets crypto in a way that no other generation understands it, mm -hmm. but but I also think that it can be learned uh, and uh, new technologies can be learned by by anybody once they see the use of mm -hmm. it and there's an interface they can uh, utilize. You, you just said something really important, right? Like the the knowledge base of the next generation of people with essentially a tool to transact with, right? Yeah. Um, is probably a lot more potent than the knowledge base of like the equivalent generation and like US dollars in the financial system, right? Yeah. Like is it is it the, the backdoor mission there in crypto to teach people finance? Like is that is that kind of a, an externality of it or do you feel that um, it's just like simple and everyone's learning together so it's a lot more like ingrained in culture? Well, I, I do think the accessibility of crypto, you know, the fact that you can open up a wallet and then invest like $10 if you want to, and uh, is, is, is a beautiful thing, right? Like sure. to, to go open up a brokerage account and then deal with mm -hmm. the, you know, it, it, there, there's an accessibility uh, and that's what I tell people. And even with some of the newer coins, if I want to see how they're trading or, or what drives their market prices, I'll do the same thing, and um, you know, just start with a small amount mm -hmm. on my personal account, and 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 so I, I think that accessibility is something that wasn't there, and we've seen it with Robinhood and um, you know sure. other other platforms that do the same thing with stocks, uh, but uh, but crypto is just the next step for that, and. Um, you know, it, it has been doing, it has done well overall. And I think there, you have to be careful there. Mm -hmm. And I, that's where I do believe financial education is important, financial literacy, yeah. um, because, uh, you know, anyone can think that it, it'll just keep going up uh, and, and they're going to be cycles. Cycles mm -hmm. have never gone away. <laughs> uh, you know, they've changed in, in time periods, uh, but uh, so, so, but I do think that crypto has made, and, and, and if you look at that on a worldwide scale, like uh, you can't access US stocks in other places, but you can access Bitcoin and sure. you can access ETH. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and a lot of our investment thesis is based on like what other financial products can we make accessible through blockchain technology to that pop, those populations. There's a company here that's been Security or tokenizing securities, mm -hmm. so basically creating, I guess, tokens that are matched to U.S. stocks and stuff mm -hmm. for the purpose of allowing like global access to, you know, sort of the way a stable coin is tied to a dollar. That these are tied to individual like securities and stuff. Yeah, I so, feel like the SEC is gonna absolutely cr crack down on that. Or yeah, but they won't. Do. Like, it's gonna take the SEC three years to figure out what's sure. going on. Yeah, you know, it's a good well, they, a lot of the SEC. Former SEC folks are at a lot of these companies yeah. now. I mean, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. so uh, it, it's been interesting yeah. to see that that happen over the last couple of years. Um, but the SEC has, uh, yeah, has gotten up to speed. Uh, in 2017, they were taken by surprise by the, what happened with the ICOs. They oh, man. have bulked up. That era bit. was wild. That that what that's like the a whole other podcast. I forgot throw that. The ICO <laughs> yeah. era. There was like, oh man. So, but, there but there's regulate. I mean, yeah. we've seen more regulation in the last couple of weeks, um, but that's what's brought in the institutions that comfort. Um, and but DeFi is going to be the next thing for yeah. regulation because that yeah. is something that is ch more challenging mm -hmm. to to regulate. Let, um, let me ask you about that. Do you, do you think that there is kind of, you know, in, in government, there's there are career bureaucrats that have a, a mentality sometimes of like. You know, this is uh, 
this is how things should work. They have a viewpoint and they kind of influence government w from within with that viewpoint. Do you think that there's going to be a tipping point in, in the United States where it, like essentially it's a national security issue or to, to some people, right? Like where, you know, you're potentially disrupting America's biggest lever, which is our currency mm -hmm. all around the world. Is that is that a big, um, do you think there are people within government that feel that way right now? I think a little bit more so. I mean, I, I talked about this topic like two two years ago when yeah. Libra <laughs> was first announced. Mm -hmm, sure. and, and I mentioned that it, it's actually potentially a threat to the dollar, um, uh, but that was also dismissed as mm -hmm. like, you know, that's like way far off. and. But but you do you keep a running checklist of all the things that people think you're wrong about and then just like, I, I've stopped because I'm, I've stopped because I'm like I have super to like petty like too. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she has an edible arrangement auto sent to these people. Yeah. Like. Um, as long as entrepreneurs keep letting me invest in their companies, then yeah. we're gonna be fine. Yeah. But um, so I. I, I do believe in the fact that we have so many countries, including China, right, that ha are establishing their central bank digital currencies. Mm -hmm. You look at that has been a response to concern about private companies, um, uh, you know, like Facebook. Um, uh, uh, it could be PayPal. Could be any 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 major company with a, a, a strong user base, mm -hmm. and if they started. Uh, an alternative currency for their user base that could be a real threat to fiat currency in terms of what's being used and circulated. Now, regulation, are these, you know, we, we're seeing regulation come in to make sure that that doesn't happen. I mean, there's a reason DM and Facebook um, hasn't been able to launch yet mm -hmm. um, uh, because I think there was so much regulatory pushback and concern. But but we are going to see a decline in uh, the dominance of the dollar. I think that's inevitable. Um, and, and if you look at history, there's not been one currency that has survived, you know, uh, I don't know what, I sh the, how many hundreds of years, but, mm -hmm. but it's just, Again, going back to cycles, it, it's just the way, and I'm also a spiritual person, and I believe the universe is made of cycles, and, mm -hmm. and uh, good luck trying to you know, disrupt those cycles. <laughs> there are other, um, you know, certainly Deep. people have tried. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and so I just think you have to work within new innovations and, and work mm -hmm. with what's also best for the majority of the people in the world because that's going to, that's going to be best for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. If we can create a stable world where people aren't fighting over, you know, certain currencies or land or people feel ownership mm -hmm. of things um, you know we we may live in a different world then so for folks like my friend Lila used this term the other day I thought it was good uh, who are crypto curious <laughs> who feel intimidated don't know where to start are getting really interested in learning more what would you recommend they do well, I think there are a lot of resources these days. Um, I mean, it's the CoinDesk, the Block, you know, these are publications that have existed in the sector for a while. They have like Crypto 101s, um, you know, videos. Uh, so I, I think that, and, and just understanding, it, it's really not rocket science at the end of the day. I mean, the beauty of, and I'm going to explain it really quickly. I mean, the beauty of Bitcoin is that um, there's just a ledger of computers around the world that keep track of every transaction that happens in, within the Bitcoin network. And that's why people say it can't be hacked, that, and, and it hasn't, Bitcoin blockchain has not been hacked. Um, and, and, and because they're all over the world, if, if one of those computers is hacked, the rest stay safe. And, um, and so you still have that ledger. Um, and, and, so, so, and that concept is being applied to lots of other cryptocurrencies and different uses. Um, but, but that's like the basic. And then um, a lot of these other um, uh, publications can go through and explain how some of these other cryptos are, are different. Um, but I also think there's, uh, you know, I would recommend people also just open a wallet and, and just, again, buy $10, $20 
whatever it is of different cryptos. And then, you know, and, and that's how you start to research more about the ones that you're invested in. You know, I think it's, uh, being someone who's sort of followed this space for a while, yeah. I think it's interesting how the narrative has changed. Like, we've become better at communicating these complex mm -hmm. topics. Because I remember the first time I heard about Bitcoin was like 2000. 11 and it was one of my super nerdy friends and we were having beers at some like ruby meetup and he was like you need to get into this bitcoin stuff and then he shows me a terminal interface this i'm like you're a crazy person <laughs> you know i was like what is this nonsense and then I, i'm like he's retired now i am not so <laughs> that's where his trajectory went but no and it was like he was like oh it's the future of money blah blah all this stuff and it's like it wasn't framed in a way that like resonated with me right, right. and i was like um, I was like, okay, why would I do this instead of just running a, a database, right? right? You know, because my concept of where you store um, records of stuff was a database, yeah. you know? And then it wasn't until years later when someone explained to me, it was like, when you don't have mutual trust in everybody, right? Yeah. You need something decentralized where everybody yeah. is verifying the facts, right? Yeah. Like, if it's a closed system that... Like Uber doesn't need a blockchain to sort of track the rides, right? But if it's a completely decentralized system where no one is the central authority over yeah. it, then that trust, the sort of in the decentralized nature, makes more sense, you yeah. know. And like it wasn't until years later when something like it was framed that way that I was like, oh, now this makes sense. It's not just a bunch of people like nerds with computers in their closets, you know printing money, you know. Yeah, but why, yeah, and the way I look at it is computers do so many other things. Yeah. Why can't they validate our transactions? Yeah. We don't yeah. need like to employ hundreds of people yeah. to say yes, this transaction, you know, and and verify ledgers and you know, if you try to send a wire to uh, overseas, it's over fifty dollars, mm -hmm. sometimes a hundred dollars. Yeah. Bitcoin That's can crazy. Uh, or crypto can you can do that. Um, for like pennies, right? Right. So I, when you start to think about some of those, and and then you, and and the other thing is just the safety, mm -hmm. where, you know, governments, banks during two thousand eight cut off access yeah. to your own bank account. Yeah. Um, you know that that's an issue. Uh, India demonetized their currency. Mm -hmm. That's when the price of Bitcoin went up a lot um, mm -hmm. in 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 India, where mm -hmm. they just said overnight, you know, like certain bills were not going to be worth anything mm -hmm. anymore. They that, weren't legal That's the tender. power, right? Like yeah. the, the, the fixed supply of Bitcoin mm -hmm. because you, you can't actually like print more of it, right? There's a, there's a cap. Well, I mean, we're mining, but the, eventually there's a cap. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that kind of solves for that risk associated with currency and money, right? Which, which is just like, well, if, you know, politicians decide to print more of it, your, your value drops. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think the inflation numbers are, you know, total BS that mm -hmm. we're seeing. I mean, I yeah. think it's at least two to three times. Um, I mean, anyone who's living, buying groceries, doing construction. Uh, I, think, <laughs> yeah. like, I think there's like an actual sort of, um, maybe it's, uh, people don't really realize that the inflation number is actually way higher than it is, but they're behaving like they inherently know it, right? Because people are putting their money into houses and other mm -hmm. things that sort of map with or track with inflation, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you see the prices of, of a house going up, that's something that's easy to sort of see, like the difference between like 100 grand now, 150 grand, mm -hmm. you know, two months from now or whatever, right? And so I think we're seeing people realizing, well, my money's doing nothing in this bank account. Let me just throw it into a house, you know, because that's an asset that, should grow and so I think it's different than whereas if we were to say it would be told by the Fed. Although then you would see yeah. more people buying uh, Bitcoin if that were the case. Yeah but it's still intimidating yeah. like yeah. people like my parents were in their mid 70s like they would it'd be sort of horrifying to them to be like oh we're putting money into this fake thing on the internet you know and I'm so like. So people are still more yeah. comfortable with something that they it's can tangible. see and touch. Yeah and, yeah yeah. 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 This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, we, we're at time, uh, but Jalik, thank you so much for, for joining us. Do you want like any, any last plugs or anything else? Yeah, you how wanna, can people find you? Yeah, how, how can people interact with you? and Invest you know, in your fund. Yeah, invest in your fund. I, I, I'm, drop um, drop your Twitter handle on here. I'm yeah. easy to find, my first name. Um, that's uh, the, the good thing about having an unusual name. Uh, J-A-L-A-K, I'm that on Twitter, Instagram can search for me uh, on LinkedIn. That's also, I check LinkedIn cool. quite a bit. So all good ways to reach out. 
Awesome. Thanks so much for, for stopping by and chatting with us, Jalik. This was awesome. You're welcome anytime back on the Miami Tech Pod. Um, and this was episode 21. We'll see you all next week. Thank you. Great to be here.